But we start off with some basic introduction and please welcome senior scientist Mette Svensson Herskin from uh, Aarhus University from the Department of Animal Science. Uh, please, Mette. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jens, and good morning. Um, as you just heard, what I'm going to do is to, to be the first in a row to kind of take you back to the introduction uh, and give an introduction to, to animal stress. Um, and what I would like to do uh, during the next uh, approximately half hour is I'll try to, to, um, to take you back to where all the knowledge we have today about animal stress. Where does it come from? Where did it start? I'll try to give some suggestions for definitions of stress, stressor and stress response. Uh, I will um, talk a bit about function of stress responses and take you back into nature in order to, to understand what the functions of stress responses are. Uh, and then I'll, I'll end by trying to convince you that stress has like an inbuilt dualism that stress is by nature adaptive but may have maladaptive consequences. So I would like to, my aim today, um, I think I was invited here because I'm not working with horses normally. So, so what I do is to, what I will do, and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to do this, is to try to, to create like a common language for, for this conference and for you to build on during the next days and when you come home. So I'm not going to talk about horses specifically. I'm going to talk about mammals, uh, but horses are mammals too. So this covers mammals. Um, but as I said, this can only be, I have got approximately half an hour, so this can just be an introduction. And when you look at this graph, you will understand why. You can see here the, the number of publications uh, dealing with, with animal and stress, which are published yearly. And uh, at present, it's more than 4,000 publications every year dealing with this topic. Uh, many of them in, in very different uh, scientific areas, such as biomedicine, animal welfare, conservation, and so on. Um, so I can only uh, suggest that within the area that, that you work, that you go back and look for literature within that specific area. Okay, the term stress. Yeah, what is it actually? Uh, if we look historically, uh, the term stress was kind of adopted, like, like the ugly duckling adopted thing, uh, into biology from mechanical engineering, where mechanical engineers, they talk about uh, uh, different materials uh, and how much stress they can take until they break. This is where it comes from. With Within the, the, uh, the Western world, I think we all know what stress is, what it feels like. I certainly felt it this morning when <laughs> actually I overslept and then there was a, a, a traffic control by the police and I had over 100 kilometers to drive to get here. I know what it's like. Rupert, you could measure on me probably. Um, but today in, in our Western world, um, even children talk about being stressed. And if we, if you just, if you Google stress just briefly, you can see that that stress-inducing conditions they can be very diverse, ranging from people feeling stressed because they are behind in their Facebook updates, <gasps> and uh, up to severe post-traumatic stress disorders. Stress is such a wide uh, concept in our human world. Uh, but what is actually going on in the body of these people and in animals? And where does this knowledge come from? That's what I want to try to explain. And in order to do so, I would like to introduce you to these two uh, um, scientists. You could say that they are the fathers of stress. The first one is Walter Cannon. Um, I'll come back to Hans Selye later. What Walter Cannon did was that he uh, studied acute stress responses. He was uh, the first to describe the role of adrenaline and he kind of coined the concept fight-flight, uh, which most of you are probably familiar with. And he also introduced the, the idea of homeostasis, the idea that there is like one set point um, and that the body is um, 
working to, to stay at this equilibrium at one set point. Um, however, before I continue talking about his work, uh, I would like just briefly to introduce you to another concept, the concept of allostasis. Because since the 1980s, the concept of homeostasis has been discussed. And an alternative has been suggested, being allostasis. And I think uh, there's been a lot of theoretical discussion going on about these two concepts. I recommend that you, you uh, look into the original literature if you're interested, but just shortly what allostasis means, that instead of just having one equilibrium, we are talking about stability through change. It might seem complicated, but what it just means is that instead of there is the body is always looking to get back to one equilibrium, we, the brain can adjust different set points according to input. For instance, if you have learned something, then your, your equilibrium will be different, but it will still be normal. So you can say that fit animals, they have a wide regulatory range. There could be many equilibriums which are all normal. That's kind of it. So if you use the, the concept of allostasis, it doesn't exclude the basic notion of homeostasis. And therefore, for simplicity, what I will do during the rest of my talk today is to continue to use uh, the word homeostasis, because there is so not so, so big differences when we are talking uh, functionally. Okay, Canon, the guy, the first father I wanted to mention. What he worked on was the autonomic nervous system. And as you are probably familiar with, the autonomic nervous system have two branches, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is activated by stress. It is characterized by arousal, vigilance, emergency, and it is able to convey fast signals from the brain via, si via the spinal cord to the system. Two important messengers in this system are noradrenaline and adrenaline, and these are able to activate organs within seconds. Contrary is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is inhibited by stress, which is characterized by calm vegetative functions, which is involved in processes in growth, digestion and energy storage, and which is stimulated during sleep or after meals. And at this figure of the, the uh, this, uh, which I took from an old textbook, you can see one organ in the middle, that's the heart. Uh, and heart, the rate of the heart has been target for many studies of stress responses in many mammals, in humans, and also in horses during recent years. Uh, not not so long ago, uh, people started to study not just the rate of the heart, but also the variability of the heart rate. Because the rate as such, simply being the number of beats per minute, is kind of the net result, you can say, of sympathetic and parasympathetic regulation. Um, so if you just measure the number of heartbeats per minute, you cannot separate the two. And instead, uh, it has been suggested to use the variation in the beat-to-beat -beat interval, which is the heart rate variability. There are different measures of heart rate variability, and I will only give very little time in my introduction to heart rate variability, because uh, later today, uh, Dr. Fisser will give you a plenary on this topic alone. Uh, but in general, uh, low heart rate variability is indicative of increased uh, sympathetic activation. Okay, so this, w this was kind of what, what uh, Walter Cannon started. And then the other father is Hans Selye. Uh, and what Hans did, actually kind of by accident, was that he, he um, showed that there are links between stress and pathology. And he did uh, during his um, exploration of glucocorticoids and his characterization of uh, glucocorticoids. What, uh, what Celia was very interested in was the function of the different hormones in the body and the different organs in the body. This was in the beginning of the uh, 20th century and this all this knowledge was not available at that time. So what he did was that he injected hormonal extracts, either that or saline, into rats in order to see what happened when they got these. He was not interested in the saline injected rats, they were kind of his control animals. Um, but what he saw then 
he, he was, and you can say, an open-minded scientist, and he looked carefully at his control animals, luckily. And, and what he saw was that the animals that he had injected with saline, they actually developed gastric ulcers. Some people say that he was not that good at handling rats, since, since his, uh, his control animals developed these conditions. Um, but what he then uh, started the characterization of was the HPA axis which he called, and what we know today, is a nonspecific defense mechanism of the body. Uh, and Celia, he, 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 used he already then used the term stress, and he found out that when, when animals are exposed to, to either chronic or stressors that are repeated many times, what they will show pathological changes, such as ulceration, such as changes in the adrenal glands, and so on. And I just put this one in uh, just to give you a brief idea about the HPA axis and the anatomical location of it. This is not a horse brain, I know. This is a human brain, but it shows you still the little part of the brain which covers the H in the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, which is connected via the median eminence to the P of the axis, the pituitary, this little part of the brain, uh, from where uh, hormones are secreted into the systemic bloodstream and reaching the adrenal gland, which is the A in the axis, which is situated on top of the kidneys. Um, and today I'm not going to talk very much uh, about how we can quantify glucocorticoids, because we have the true expert uh, in this matter uh, speaking just after me. Professor Palme, he will introduce that topic to you later. Okay. I really, I still, I haven't defined what stress is. Uh, and there is a reason for that. <laughs> because I think this one is, it can be hard to handle sometimes. Because if you look in the scientific literature, you can see so many different definitions of stress. You shouldn't read uh, through them all. I just want to show you that there are many. And I want to emphasize two of them. The red one here in the middle from a, an ethological textbook saying that stress is something that is prolonged and severe, that stress is associated with situations that animals avoid, where normal motivational processes have been stressed beyond the normal adaptive range. This is really serious business. We're this seems to be very, very serious for the animals, very adverse. And then if you look at this one, the black one, uh, coming from a physiological review, it says very differently. It says that stress covers physiological and behavioral adaptations aimed to defense homeostasis and or allostasis coordinated by the stress system mediators. So according to this definition, stress can be just a slight adaptation in order to defend homeostasis. But this is not the same. No, that's true. This is not the same. There are very many different stress definitions out there. And I think this confusion has led people to suggest that, okay, then skip, let's not use the word stress anymore. But I agree very much with uh, Don Broom, who suggested that, no, we should not skip it. It is true that it is confusing, but instead of skipping it, we should refine it, and we should use the term rather than discard it. However, it is important, since there are so many definitions, and there's many more than these, always when you use the term stress, be aware of what your definition is, let people know what it is, and when you read stuff by other people, be sure what they mean by stress, whether they mean something which is very adverse to the animals, or something that can I mean, it's just a slight adaptation along the way. One very important guy uh, for our present understanding of animal stress responses is this one, and it's the man to the left I'm talking about, the primate to the left. Um, this is Robert Sapolsky. Uh, he is a pro it's an old picture. He's approaching 60 years uh, now. And ever since he was a student, he has done, I mean, marvelous work uh, studying social interactions, uh, stress responses, and pathology in wild African baboons. And why did he do that? He was interested in the relations between stress and pathology. And he thought that in order to understand this, we need to focus on the biological function of stress. And what I will suggest that, uh, sorry, um, I would have loved to, to, um, to have more time today to tell you about all his fantastic work, but I don't. And I have a, an, uh, 
chairperson sitting over here. No, you don't have time either, I know. Uh, so what I will do instead is that I will suggest warmly that you take a look, if you're interested, that you take a look into this book. Um, it is a paperback book. It is very cheap, less than 10 euro. Um, and it goes through very, very elegantly, I think, through all the knowledge at present about how uh, stress and pathology is related. And it is written in a, you could say, popular scientific way. So everybody should be uh, able to read it. However, it does contain all the scientific references in the back. I would also suggest that you go online and look uh, for Robert Sapolsky and check some of his uh, lectures, many of his lectures giving, uh, given at, uh, from, from the uni university where he works are available online and he is a fantastic lecturer. There is also this program, a National Geographic program where he presents his work, his lifelong work with this project. It is called Stress Portrait of a Killer and it, you can also find that one uh, online. Okay. But what I will do now is I will come up with a suggestion of stress terminology based on, um, on the work, for instance, by, by Sapolsky. And in order to, to uh, make a logical introduction of this terminology, I think it makes sense to not start defining stress, but start defining what a stressor is. A stressor is an event. It can be internal or external to the body which involves a real or a potential threat to the maintenance of homeostasis. This is a stressor. We have a threatening event, or potentially threatening event. Stressors, they lead to stress responses, which are all behavioral and or physiological reactions aiming to re-establish the homeostasis. So all that the body does to re-establish homeostasis will be stress responses. What goes on then in the body is that this threat will oh sorry this threat will be perceived by the central nervous system, initiating a biological defense. You could say it is a combination of behavioral, uh, neural, hormonal, or immunological responses, all aiming to re-establish homeostasis. And as long as this stress response is going on, the body is in a state of stress. So taking it backwards again, stress is a state you're in. When your body is showing stress responses, aiming to re-establish homeostasis after you have met some threat, which might be a real threat or a potential threat. Okay. In order to, to understand the function of stress responses, um, I will try to do what Sapolsky suggests and go into nature. And if we should look for potential uh, stresses, equine stresses in nature, it could be predators, attacks from predators, it could be aggression, it could be a parasite attack, it could be extreme weather, for instance. But the easiest one to explain, and the most logical one, I think, to explain the function of the stress responses is the predator attack. So for a few minutes, I would like you to uh, think about a zebra running at the savannah, Start, and it, perhaps it's not running from the beginning, it's eating at the savannah. Uh, and then this huge male lion shows up on the scene and, and initiates a predator attack. Uh, what then will happen? Behaviorally, uh, the function of the behavior during stress is to facilitate adaptive responses in order to overcome the stress. So the behavior should help the zebra uh, avoid being killed uh, by the lion. Uh, and, and what will the zebra do? The zebra will orientate towards the stressor. It will focus its senses on, on, uh, on the lion. It will stop sniffing for females or eating or whatever, whatever is going on. Uh, the zebra will suppress its normal activity and prepare for this fight or flight response. Uh, then, after having tried running fiercely and kicking and, and perhaps for a long time, uh, trying to sev several times perhaps to, to uh, kick the lion away in order to avoid him, the zebra will, if actually it does happen that the lion gives up, as it did in this BBC show, uh, the zebra will reassume its normal behavior relatively quickly after the, the, um, the lion has, has given up. 
Okay, that sounds easy. But what, what goes on in the body? What is it that goes on in the body that actually helps to, to overcome the stressor and to re-establish this balance? Here we have, and I apologize for the, the uh, non-atomic correctness, anatomical, sorry, correctness for, for, uh, for this figure. This is a, a very schematic version of the, the figure you saw before with, with the brain and the, and the kidneys. This here is uh, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, all within the brain, the spinal cord, and the adrenals of a model mammal. Um, and what happens then when the zebra becomes aware of the presence of the lion. I mean, within uh, fractions of seconds, uh, nerve terminals in the spinal cord will secrete noradrenaline, which then will uh, affect the, the, um, the adrenal medulla uh, and leading to, to secretion of adrenaline. This goes very quickly. You know what it's like. Everybody knows what it's like. If I slam the door very quickly, you will have, or very hard, you will have this response comes so quickly. But still, just within seconds, uh, neurons in, in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus will secrete a corticotrophin releasing hormone into just within the brain. This is just via the media and eminence. So it's just secreted within the brain directly to the pituitary and stimulating uh, cells in the pituitary to secrete ACTH. This hormone now is uh, released into systemically. So now we have it in the bloodstream. Now we have it everywhere. Uh, and also opioids are secreted. When uh, the adrenal gland, when this ACTH reaches the adrenal gland, it stimulates the adrenal gland to secrete glucocorticoids. In many mammals and in horses too, this will be cortisol. Okay? But how does this help the zebra? It does in many ways. Because this very, very quick change in the sympathetic uh, ac activation of the sympathetic nervous system leads to cardiovascular changes, many changes. For instance, increased heart rate. For instance, I increased breathing. All changes that can help the zebra to get oxygen to his muscles. Because remember the zebra, he's running all that he can. And he might be running for quite some time. It was a strong and heavy lion that was chasing him. Uh, so they really need the oxygen in order to overcome the stressor. In addition, the zebra is not only getting oxygen, but the, the stress response will also help him to change physiological processes in the body. So he's no longer storing energy for, for the cold winter. No, now he's like this very quickly mobilizing energy. Lots of energy will be available for these muscles that need to kick so strongly uh, in order to, to uh, avoid the lion. And should the lion <coughs> come too close and damage the zebra, uh, part of the stress response also helps the zebra to, to have a period of reduced pain sensitivity, which makes sense because then the zebra will be able to continue to run and kick instead of starting to, to show pain responses. Okay, now it makes sense. It becomes clear now, I think, I hope at least, that stress responses, they do help animals. And this is actually what they were evolved for. Stress responses were evolved to overcome stresses such as predators. But now I talked about energy mobilization and that they stopped storing energy. These stress responses, they must be very expensive for the body. And they are. Definitely they are. This is uh, just an, a graph from some old work I did myself uh, using a stressor of 15 minutes of social isolation in dairy cows. But I just want to show you, this here is the animals that were isolated. You can see the yellow bar is the period they were isolated. You can see very quickly we saw an increase in the plasma concentration of cortisol, uh, just as the zebra would show. But also, rather quickly, it starts falling back again. Stress responses, you can say they shut themselves down. Uh, and I don't really have time today to talk very much about the shutting down of stress responses. I just want to tell you that what happens is that the whole system shuts down by negative feedback. And neg negative feedback means that as soon as it is started, actually, processes are initiated to turn it down again, if we're talking about a zebra and a lion. 
And this makes sense very much uh, biologically because it limits the possible negative consequences, all the costs of having all this oxygen and energy in your blood when it's no longer needed. But then, okay, what if we go back to our farm animals? Uh, what if it is not a lion, which is the stressor, which hopefully will either eat me or go away in a little while? What if it is adverse long-term conditions that we expose our animals to? Yeah, then it's a different story. This slide shows you some general, uh, it was aimed to give you like a general overview of results from many different studies of what happens when we keep animals under long-term adverse conditions. It could, for instance, be like housing animals in crowded conditions with too little space. That could be one stressor. It could be many different stressors. And what we, in general, will see is first, as I mentioned, this increase in cortisol, which depending on the animal species and on the different stressors and characteristics of the stressor, sometimes the increase in cortisol will remain for a long time and sometimes it's not that persistent and it will go down again. But what we will see will be changes in the animal's response to ACTH challenge or other stressors. So a stressed animal will respond differently to other stressors. And I saw in the program that later today uh, you're going to hear about um, uh, crib biting horses and how they respond to ACTH challenges. And this is just in order to investigate how their stress functions are. Uh, typically animals will show uh, increased adrenal weight after treatments like this. They will, you can see indications uh, that they are less able to learn. They show reduced memory. They will show increased aggression, decreased reproduction, and, uh, and there are also a number of typical pathological states that you can see. So this is very different from just the lion on the savannah. This here is serious business. Uh, and this is what I mean by stress having this dualism. It's very adaptive and it makes sense. The stress responses, they are by nature adaptive, uh, but they can have uh, severe adverse consequences when we come into states where you can say the adaptive mechanisms, they break down. Regarding the pathology, the classical uh, pathological conditions that we see in animals that have been exposed to long-term stressors will be decreased immune function, increased infections, increased risk of gastric ulceration, and increased risk of cardiac diseases. We know that from humans too. Uh, unfortunately, there are no simple indicator for when these maladaptive consequences will be initiated. You can't say like oh, three weeks and then. It's not like that. You can't say, okay, cortisol has to be 40 whatever percent increased and then no. It's not as simple as that. There is no simple way of indicating this. What, what we might say is that when stresses have been on going on for too long, if they have been there too often, and often if they involve psychological uh, aspects or if it's social stresses, these, these characteristics of a stressor will increase the risk of these different pathological conditions. Within the study of animal welfare, some people have found it difficult with this, uh, with this stress definition, going that, that stress is something you can experience just as a slight adaptation and all the way up to something very severe that can almost kill you. Uh, and therefore, uh, Gary Moberg, he suggested that we should use the term distress as a characterization of the biological state where the stress response has a deleterious effect on the individual's welfare. That's one way of trying to, to, um, to you can say, clarify the, 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 the language of stress that we are using. I, it's not necessary to use this term, but some people find it helpful. I talked a bit during the last minutes about characteristics of stressors, how long they are, they, their duration, for instance. Uh, but one very important thing uh, regarding the consequences of stress is also how a stressor is perceived. And what do I mean by that? I mean, it, whether this condition of stress will be uh, harmful for you might very well depend on how you experience it. Some individuals might experience one stressor as being not that bad, and some individuals might, for instance, because they have learned something, uh, experience a stressor as being much worse. And it's the same stressor. 
If you have experiences with, with I don't know, uh, hearing the noises from ambulances, some might get really, really frightened from it, and other people who have not had uh, been close to ambulances will just consider it a novel sound. And it's the same with animals. Um, so how the stressor is perceived is very important for how, for the consequences of, of uh, it's not just the physical uh, characteristics of the stressor. But there are other characteristics of stresses which are important for, for the consequences of the state of stress. For instance, their frequency, their intensity, uh, the degree, the level of novelty involved, the degree of control that you have with the stressor, or the predictability of the stressor. All these uh, characteristics of the stressor are um, involved in, in uh, the, the consequences of the stress as such. And what actually do I mean by degree of control and, and predictability? Hmm, yeah. In order to try to explain that, I would like to finalize my talk by, by going through some, some studies uh, that Weiss did a long time ago, uh, in the late 60s. Uh, and he used the rat as a model animal. And what he did was he had groups of rats. This here is supposed to uh, indicate one group of rats. This is another group of rats and the third group of rats. And they were all kept in cages like this, uh, where there is an electric grid in the floor uh, connected to, to a, a shock generator. So what he can do is when he clicks, it wasn't on the computer then, but, but uh, when he clicks, he can start the power and they will get electric shocks in their feet. Uh, the same for these ones. And this is the control group. They don't get any electric shocks, they're just kept in the cages. And then you can see the rat here, it is pressing a lever. So there are levers, one lever in each uh, cage, which the rats are, have been taught that they can press. And there is also this red dot here is a signal light, which I will come back to. What he did then in his studies uh, was that, that this group of rats over here, he taught them that be when I turn on this red light, you get shock in like 10 seconds. So they were warned. They knew, just like when you're at the dentist, he tells you it's gonna hurt a little. Then you know uh, something bad is coming. These ones knew something bad was coming, and these ones didn't have a clue. And they got the same shocks. And these ones didn't get any shocks. So this is the predictability. These ones could predict what's going on. And what did he saw? That the rats in this group, the rats that could predict the stressor, they had much less, they developed much less uh, ulcers in their stomachs than these ones. These ones didn't get any ulcers. Uh, predictability can help you not to have so bad consequences of stressors. And it's the same with animals. If you can predict it, it's not that bad. The other uh, stressor characteristics I was talking about was control. And what does that mean? Here he did a very elegant study, I think, because these rats then were able to, when they pressed the lever, uh, they could turn off the power. So he turned on the power, and then they sat there with electric shocks in their feet, and then they could, they, they could press the lever, and then the, the current was turned off. But what about these ones over here? They could also press the lever, but nothing happened. Uh, but when these rats pressed their lever and the current was turned off, it was also turned off over here. You understand? So they got, these rats got exactly the same electric shocks as these ones. Exactly the same. It was the same stressor. Not exactly the same. But these ones had the power, you can say, uh, to turn it off. They could control it. They knew, okay, I know it's going to come, but I can turn it off. And what happened? Just the same. The rats over here developed much less uh, stomach ulcers than the rats over here. And it was the same power that had gone through their bodies. It was the same electric shocks. So if you are working with stress and stress responses, remember that the characteristics of a stressor and how stressors are perceived uh, are very important for, for, uh, for the consequences of the stress that the animals are going through. And this takes me to my conclusions. What I have been tried to do this morning is to suggest some definitions and terms for you. As you know, 
and I have told you there are many definitions. I'm not saying mine are the right one. These is, are just some suggestions. Uh, but I will strongly recommend that you always, in your work with stress, that you always define your definition of stress and that you are aware of what definitions other people use. Because as I told you, it can be very different. I believe that the functional understanding of stress responses are very important for our understanding uh, of the work that we do in domestic animals or the work that you do in horses. So it can be important sometimes to have this functional understanding and to think about the zebra on the savanna, even though we're not studying them. And I've tried to convince you that there is this dualism of stress, that stress is adaptive by nature, but that it can have potential maladaptive consequences. I have um, tried to convince you that stressor characteristics and how stressors are perceived are very important for the consequences of the state of stress that we expose animals or humans to. And I will recommend strongly that in work uh, on where we try to understand the stress biology of animals, that we combine different measures, uh, behavioral and physiological measures, and that we at the same time are aware of the life history of the involved individuals, because then it becomes easier to interpret this uh, complex area. And I will be happy to take questions in a little while, but I just want to tell you that I will be here today until after lunch, so, so if you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to ask me later, if you, do, if you feel like it's not nice to, to ask them in the audience. Okay? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mette, also for keeping the time so perfect. <laughs> and uh, now we have room for some uh, questions. Uh, is there any with questions in the audience? You can raise your hand and then we have some helpers with microphones getting around to you. Is there anyone who wants to ask? And as Meta said, she will also be around. We have a question here. Thank you, Meta, for a very nice talk. Um, I've heard a lot about it before, but uh, that's okay. Uh, what I would like to ask you about, you mentioned the, the very strong mechanisms of feedback for glucocorticoids. Yeah. Um, obviously, that must happen during chronic stress. What's the current view on how you explain these things, chronic stress versus the shutting off of the system? Are there any new theories on that topic? <laughs> or haven't you gotten any further since no, I don't long think ago? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there probably are, of course, but, but it's still this discussion whether the, the, um, the capacity of, of the physiological systems when they become like over, um, when, when the capacity of the system is no longer there, then we'll see these, these, these responses. I think it's more or less the same. And we have a question down there, uh, around the ale. Good morning. Um, I was just wondering, have you ever looked at stress responses when you don't allow uh, animals to sleep, potentially, as my research is into sleep? So like not, being a, not allowing an animal to sleep, and then does that have a stress response to that? If you're depriving them from sleep? Yes. Uh, I am aware of many studies where they have deprived animals the opportunity to rest, which is not the same as sleep, I know. But, but um, and the deprivation of rest has, has uh, been used experimentally as a stressor and leads to, to strong stress responses, of course, depending on what animal species we're talking about, because some species for, for some species, the resting behavior is more important than for others. Um, and I, I have seen actually recent work done on, on, um, on deprivation of sleep as such, where they try to, and also in humans, of course, where they, where they try to prevent them from sleeping, and it is definitely a stressor, yes. If I can supplement, I also would say like the question from Jan Lerdewi that one of the, uh, we, we have lack of chronic stress measures, and one of the things, and also posters on today, uh, is about uh, whether you can use sleep as an indicator of stress. And I think also there's a lot of literature on using 
uh, sleep patterns as a chronic yeah. stress indicator. So I think the future will have more focus on developing methods in for chronic stress and sleep can be indeed I think it's one of the, the future things. We have a question down here, Susan. Thank you for a very nice talk, Mede. Do you think that the the predictability factor um, can be actually helpful to horses that are being trained in perhaps very harsh regimes with with maybe very tough and very forceful training that that it's helping them if it's at least predictable I think asking me that question is uh, directing that question to me is kind of the wrong way that to send it because I'm not at all an expert in horse training and you have so many experts in horse training here today so so um, I will recommend that Predictability is important, uh, but if we talk, and, and the, of course the, the stressor will always be, no, not always, but will often be adverse to some extent. Uh, but, Yanni, will you comment on that one? Well, well I think that's, that just as you presented, Meta, that for horses, just as for all other animals, predictability can help them overcome the stressor. So, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, one last quick question. Oh, yeah, over there, please. Hi, thank you. That was really clear and, um, and a fantastic start. Um, I just wanted to ask you a little bit of a, a question about emotions and where they come into it because you could, having gone through your talk, think that this was actually quite a, a mechanical exercise and whilst you talked about perceived threat, mm. you didn't talk about the first stage and I'd just like to give you the opportunity to talk about emotions and where that plays a role because obviously animal welfare is about the way the animal feels yeah. rather than necessarily the whole mechanical system. I think you're right. With, within animal welfare, it is like an, an um, it covers both. I think both how the animals feel and what is going on in the body, because these are so intertwined. Um, but but um, no, I haven't been. I didn't have time today to talk very much about emotions. Uh, but of course, the the I, I tried to put it in the this perceived. Uh, the minutes that I talked about the, how, how animals are perceiving the stressor because this it is part of this discussion uh, that how you respond to stressors depend very much on how you perceive them uh, and of I mean mammals are our uh, sentient uh, yeah animals so they are of course able to to experience emotions and their emotional state will of course affect how they how they respond to stress but that's a research area within itself I think we'll stop now. And please thank you, Meta, once more for a very good introduction.